Hey guys, it's Kaylee and welcome back to Hippie in a Suit where every week I talk about sustainability and today I'm in a new location because it's the only place I can find where you can't hear my neighbor's kids screaming through the walls. You may remember that in one of my very first videos, I covered the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the 17 SDGs. Today, I'm going to be kicking off a new series that's gonna provide a lot more detail on that agenda by covering each individual SDG and explaining what it is, what we're aiming to achieve with it, and where we currently stand. You can probably imagine that for the first video in this series, I'm gonna start with sustainable development goal number one, no poverty. So today, that's what we're gonna cover. We're gonna go over all the targets that are part of that goal, and we're gonna look at where we currently stand on achieving it. So without further ado, let's kick off. Okay, so SDG number one, no poverty, is a goal that's made up of seven targets. I didn't really get into this in the SDG video, but there's actually two types of targets within the 2030 agenda. There are substantive targets that lay out what we're trying to achieve, and there are what's called means of implementation. And these means of implementation targets are more focused on kind of the enabling factors or the pieces that we need in order to achieve the more substantive goals. So this would include things like trade, technology, financing, etc. So in this particular goal, there are five substantive targets and two means of implementation. When most of us think of poverty, we immediately think of income, as in the amount of money that we make per day or per week, month, or year, and the quality of life that that affords us. That's a measure that's quite simple to think through, and most people think of that when they think of poverty, living on less than a certain amount per day, for example. However, experts who work in poverty alleviation stress that it's a very multi-dimensional problem and there's no one single cause or factor. It encompasses a whole host of factors, including poor health, lack of education, inadequate living standards, disempowerment, poor quality of work, threat of violence, and living in areas that are environmentally hazardous, among others. In other words, there's no single cause of poverty. It can be caused by many factors, including unemployment, social exclusion, a lack of safety nets, and vulnerabilities to disasters, diseases, and other phenomena which may prevent productivity. Having this more holistic frame can help us to develop solutions and policies that look at these systemic issues instead of just focusing on income. The last thing I want to mention before we dive into the individual targets and how we're doing on them is that poverty can be measured in both absolute and percentage terms. And I note this because when you're hearing on the news or reading an article, you might come across the statistics given in different ways. And I think it's important to make the differentiation so you know what each one means. Absolute terms is just the total number of people on the planet that live in poverty. So the aggregate total number. Percentage terms is obviously the proportion of people. So out of the total global population, how many as a percent live in poverty? I mention this because both of these terms matter when we're thinking about poverty alleviation and you might hear both of them referenced. So, you know, pre about 30 years ago, we were in a situation where the percentage of people living in poverty was dropping, but the absolute number was growing, and that was because of population growth. So even though the percentage was going down, part of that had to do with the fact that the population was getting larger. So when we look at these statistics, it's important to know which one we're referencing, and I'm happy to report that for the last approximately 30 years, we have been decreasing the absolute, the total number of people living in poverty, as well as the percentage. Of course, COVID has thrown a wrench into that progress, which I will talk about a little bit later in the video. But just so you know the difference and you know uh, what to look for when you come across these numbers in articles, the news, Twitter, wherever you might be reading about them. Target 1.1. By 2030, eradicate extreme poverty for all people everywhere, currently measured as people living on less than 125 per day. Globally, extreme poverty is measured on the international poverty line. This was a number that was put forward by the World Bank for the first time in 1990, and at that time was $1 per day. 
It's a standardized measure because it equalizes across all countries using what's called purchasing power parity and sets that limit or that line for what is considered extreme poverty across the globe. Now, today, because of course of inflation and price changes, the number is no longer $1 per day, but rather $1.90 per day. That's extreme poverty globally, if you live under $1.90 per day. The interesting thing here to note is in the agenda, I just read the target, it's $1.25 per day. So where does this $1.90 come in? Well, the World Bank adopted a new international poverty line just after the agenda was adopted. So in all the measurement around the agenda, the $1.90 is being used, even if $1.25 was what was in the target. So where do we stand on this target right now? Well, globally, and according to the most recent data, one in 10 people or 10% of the global population, roughly 734 million people live in extreme poverty. It's important to note that the majority of those people are in sub-Saharan Africa and that four out of five people living in extreme poverty live in some sort of rural setting. This is a big number and it is concerning, but it also represents a lot of progress over the last 30-ish years. In 1990, the global poverty rate was actually 36%. So getting to 10% is a lot of progress in a relatively short period of time. Having said that, of course, we are now in a COVID context, and the question is what that's going to mean for global poverty. At this moment, it's expected that COVID could push as much as half a billion people or 8% of the global population back into extreme poverty, erasing a lot of the great progress that's been made since 1990. We still don't know the exact numbers, but this is something to keep an eye on when looking at how we're doing on this particular target. Target 1.2, by 2030, reduce at least by half the proportion of men, women, and children of all ages living in poverty in all its dimensions according to national definitions. So this particular target seems very similar to the first one, but it's slightly different because it's very much focused on the national or country level context. The reason for this, of course, is that money is not the same everywhere it doesn't go as far in some places as it does in others and therefore a national poverty line needs to be put in the context of the country in which you live to give you a quick example i live in switzerland and i'm from canada so a dollar in switzerland does not go near as far as a dollar goes in canada but if i were to go to burkina faso that dollar would go much further than in either of those first countries i mentioned so you can start to see how it's important when you're setting a poverty line for a country that it's relevant to the current context living context of that country so this particular target is looking at each individual country's poverty line and asking or saying that we should reduce poverty by at least half according to those country measures. All right, so where are we on this one? Well, I'm a little ashamed at how much time I actually spent searching for this because the truth is the data is just like apples to oranges. Every country kind of looks at poverty a bit different, they might include different things in it. And I was looking for some comparable statistics that I could show, you know, in different countries, here's what their poverty line is and here's how many people are below it. But it just wasn't that simple. I also suspect a piece of this, to be honest, is political because it's never good for politicians to say, you know, this percentage of people is in poverty. And so I think that there's not always a lot of transparency around these measures because it is a politically sensitive issue. I will share some of the statistics I could find, but again, I just wanted to caution that it was very hard to find comparable data and things that I thought, you know, I could rely on and that were from the same year and that looked at the data in the same way. So I'll share a little bit of what I found just to give you a sense, but keep in mind that again, it's not super transparent. So the first statistic I found is that two thirds of the world population lives on less than $10 per day. So 66% of the world's population. It's one thing to keep in mind. Now let's dive into some countries you may know and I could kind of show you how the different poverty lines vary in those countries and the percentage of people living in poverty in those countries. 
All right, in the US, I found a poverty line of $12,880 per year for one person and $26,500 per year for a family of four. I found a lot of variance in the actual percentage of people living in poverty, but the numbers I'm going to share in this comparison all come from the OECD and are comparing high income countries. And they said that the US has a 17.8% unemployment rate, but I will note the US government uh, reports that a lot lower. So maybe they're including uh, different measures, like for example, including different ages of people uh, within that number. In Canada, the poverty line is 18,771 per year for one person and $37,542 per year for a family of four. Canada's unemployment rate, again, according to the OECD comparison chart, was 11.9%. In the United Kingdom, the poverty line was 8,112 pounds per year for one person and 19,812 pounds per year for a family of four. The poverty line, again, on the OECD data was 12.4%. In Switzerland, which is where I currently live, the poverty line you'll see is quite a bit higher because as many people know, the cost of living is crazy here. So for one person, it's 27,348 francs per year and 47,712 francs per year for a family of four. The poverty rate in Switzerland, again, according to the OECD data, is 9.2%. So as you can see from that, it's definitely a little bit hard to compare, but I hope you get a sense of how much a poverty line can change based on the country's context. And also, I hope it helps you to see that poverty is an issue that is politically charged. No politicians, as I said, want people to be in poverty under their watch. And so this just again goes to what I was saying at the beginning, that you have to dig into the data and really understand what you're consuming because it's not always as cut and dry as just numbers. Target 1.3, implement nationally appropriate social protection systems and measures for all, including floors, and by 2030 achieve substantial coverage of the poor and the vulnerable. With this one, I'm going to admit that I had never heard the term social protection until I started working in UN circles. So I don't think it's a super commonly well-known uh, term. So I'm gonna try and break it down for you because it does have a few dimensions. So social protection refers to, you know, guaranteed income support in cases of being unable to work such as old age, sickness, maternity, unemployment, disability, loss of a major income earner, etc. However, according to the World Bank and the International Labor Organization, who are kind of the authorities on social protection, social protection goes beyond just income support. It also includes programs that provide things like healthcare, links individuals to jobs, helps to improve a country's productivity or people's productivity, invests in children's well-being and education, and protects aging populations. I know it's not the best source, but Wikipedia actually broke down the types of social protection into three main categories that I think are very helpful when trying to understand the concept. So the first major category is labor market interventions, which are policies and programs designed to promote employment, the efficient operation of labor markets and the protection of workers, social insurance, which mitigates risks associated with unemployment, ill health, disability, work-related injury, and old age. And this includes things such as health insurance and unemployment insurance and social assistance, which are resources, either cash or in kind, that are transferred to vulnerable individuals or households with no other means of adequate support, including single parents, the homeless, or the physically or mentally challenged. Now you will have seen in the target that there's also a mention of floors. Social protection floors are the minimum or very basic levels of support that governments need to give people. And the ILO has four major categories for this support. The first is access to essential health care. The second is basic security of services for children, including nutrition, education, and care. 
The third is basic income security for people of an active age who are unable to earn a sufficient income, particularly in cases of sickness, unemployment, maternity, or disability. And finally, basic income security for older persons who are no longer of working age. So where we're at on this one is a little bit depressing. Unfortunately, only 27% of the world's population has adequate social protection and only 22% of the world's unemployed workers have unemployment insurance. I think we have seen this in a big way with COVID and how many people were left in vulnerable positions because they did not have adequate social protection. And so this is a huge priority of the agenda. I mean, all of these things are priorities, but you know, especially in the context of this year, we've seen how important it is to have those social safety nets. Target 1.4. By 2030, ensure that all men and women, in particular the poor and vulnerable, have equal rights to economic resources, as well as access to basic services, ownership and control over land and other forms of property, inheritance, natural resources, appropriate new technology and financial services, including microfinance. Now there is a lot wrapped up in this particular target as you could see by its length. There are generally kind of three major components. I think one that's quite self-explanatory and two that require a little more explanation. So those three components would be the kind of basic services, access to basic services. The second would be tenure and legal holding over property resources, etc. And the third would be the kind of general provision for access to finance uh, and technology. So that's the one that's the most self-explanatory. The other two, I think, take a little bit unpacking. So let's start with basic services. So access to basic services includes a few major components. There is sanitation, water, the condition of the dwelling in which people live, overcrowding, and the level of education of the household. This is how access to basic services is measured. The other side is the tenure piece. And this is one where, you know, it's something I had heard a lot about in passing, but I never really dug into until actually research for this video. So the idea here is that it's impossible for people to lift themselves out of poverty if they do not have adequate control or legal title to the resources that give them their income and their livelihoods. And so what this part of the target is talking about is ensuring that uh, vulnerable communities in particular, like indigenous people, for example, have access to a uh, legal title and access to their uh, land and resources. And the reason this one's quite important is we're seeing this more and more with uh, resource development, for example, where we're seeing people's uh, titles to their land or their rights to their land being undermined in order to develop a resource or to change the landscape, expand a city, these types of things. So this particular target is also looking at that dimension, how legally sound people's rights to their own land and resources actually are. Now, where we stand on this one is tough. And this is where I'm going to use this as an opportunity to explain another criticism of the 2030 agenda, and that is lack of data. When I went and was looking for data on this particular topic, I couldn't find anything. I found one statistic from 2012 that said 8.6% of the population is living with unmet basic access to services and needs, but I couldn't find anything else, nothing on the legal tenure, nothing on the ability to access technology or financial services, uh, very little on, as I was just saying, the basic needs and access to services. So it, it's a tough one. And this is one of the criticisms of the agenda. So I don't have a good answer for you of where we currently stand on this, but I can tell you there is a process that's ongoing to look at each of the indicators that there's not adequate data or measurement systems for and to build that capacity. So these indicators are kind of grouped in those that have a methodology and those that don't. And once there's a methodology, those where data is being collected and those that are not. And the idea is that if you have a methodology and data is being collected, that's called a tier one indicator. 
A tier two is when there is a methodology, but the data is not being collected. So you just need to build the system for collecting the data. And then a tier three indicator is when there's no methodology. So people don't even know how to measure it and there's no system. And this is an ongoing process of the UN statistics and all countries working together to finalize and, and put more detail around particularly those tier three, but also the tier two indicators and to build the systems needed to collect that data so that we know where we're at. But for this particular one, I'm sorry to say I don't have very good information. And I think that this is one where we need to keep watching to see what happens as the indicator system gets improved. Target 1.5. By 2030, build the resilience of the poor and those in vulnerable situations and reduce their exposure and vulnerability to climate-related extreme events and other economic, social, and environmental shocks or disasters. This target is highlighting the very sad fact that those who are poor and vulnerable are the most at risk when it comes to global shocks. And when I say shocks, I'm not just talking about climate and weather and, and, and disasters like we might think off the top of our head, although of course that is part of it. But the other part is also social or economic shocks. For example, what we've seen with COVID, which was a health crisis. So there's a whole component of keeping people healthy and safe, and that's a big shock and difficult for poor and vulnerable communities to deal with, as well as the resulting economic shock which was caused by the lockdowns and the huge change in our behavior as a society and what that meant for the economy and people who are vulnerable in those situations. So this particular target is saying that we need to build resilience in communities to uh, really be able to deal with these shocks that may come about and to take steps to protect themselves um, so that they are not put further back as a result of these shocks. Okay, so for this particular target, there is some data, but it is a bit tricky to navigate because it's all focused on proportionality. So it talks about how, or it shows in the data, how the poorest and most vulnerable communities are facing the brunt or a larger percentage than you would expect of the results of these shocks. Because the fact is these shocks affect all communities, regardless of if they're vulnerable or not. But what we're seeing and what the data is pointing to is that those communities that are vulnerable face a disproportionate amount of threat and cost as a result of them. So let me quickly show you that. So according to the Sendai framework for measurement, in 2018, there were 23,458 deaths and 2,164 people missing. And this was attributed to disasters in 80 countries. So 80 countries reported. This led to an economic loss of 23.6 billion. And this was by 63 countries. So you can see kind of a difference in how many countries reported, but this will help you to kind of get a sense of, of the, the damage. Least developed countries are disproportionately affected in this data. So let me show you what I mean by that. LDCs made up 14% of the number of people, the population mentioned. So as I mentioned, there was 80 countries and LDCs made up 14% of the total population of those countries. Yet they reported 29% of the deaths. So again, this is the proportionality piece I was talking about. If this was affecting everyone equally, you would have expected to see somewhere around 14% of the deaths because that was the population that the least developed countries made up. But no, you're seeing double that. You're seeing 29%, so a disproportionate effect on least developed countries. Similarly, least developed countries made up just 2% of the GDP of those 63 countries that reported economic losses, but they suffered 10% of the total direct economic losses. So five times what we would have expected to see. Again, this really shows that disproportionate effect that poor countries and communities face when it comes to shocks and disasters. All right, so I will close out by going over the last two targets, which are the means of implementation that I mentioned, just to give you a sense of those enabling factors that also need to be present to meet the targets we just talked about in the first part of this video. 
So the means of implementation are target 1.A is to ensure significant mobilization of resources from a variety of sources, including through enhanced development cooperation in order to provide adequate and predictable means for developing countries, in particular least developed countries, to implement programs and policies to end poverty in all its dimensions. And target 1.B is to create sound policy frameworks at the national, regional, and international levels based on pro-poor and gender-sensitive development strategies to support accelerated investment in poverty eradication actions. As you can see, the means of implementation targets in the poverty goal are very much focused on the policy approach that's taken, ensuring that it's pro-poor and gender-sensitive, and the financial resources needed to lift people out of poverty and it mentions specifically aid so again those enabling pieces that are needed to make progress on this goal so with that i'm going to summarize and close out you can see that there is so much in just even one goal and it covers such a wide range of topics related to eliminating that goal and this is why there's so much detail in this agenda so let me summarize SDG 1 before we close out for today. SDG 1 focuses on creating a world with no poverty. It is comprised of seven targets, five of which are substantive and two of which are means of implementation. It takes the frame of a multi-dimensional form of poverty, not simply based on income, but a whole host of factors that lead to a person's quality of life. Having this holistic view helps us to address the issue more systemically. Poverty can be measured in both absolute and percentage terms, absolute being the total number of people living in poverty and percentage being the share of the population living in poverty. The first target is focused on eradicating extreme poverty or the number of people living on less than $1.90 per day. Currently, 10% of the world's population falls into this category, but this is down from 36% in 1990, showing promising progress. Unfortunately, extreme poverty is expected to rise in 2020 for the first time in 20 years due to COVID-19. The data is still being calculated on the exact impact, but it, some people believe it will be as much as half a billion people or 8% of the total global population. Target two of goal number one is focused on reducing by at least half the proportion of men, women, and children living in poverty in countries. This focuses on country poverty lines and helps to put the national context at play, recognizing that money is worth different amounts in different countries and quality of life is affected by a host of contextual factors as well. It was very hard to find data that can be compared, but generally there are some sites that provide comparison across multiple countries to understand their poverty rate and their poverty lines. The third target is focused on social protection. Social protection are the systems that provide income security in cases of old age, unemployment, sickness, invalidity, work injury, maternity, or loss of income. But it also includes a host of programs that help and go beyond just income support and help to provide the basic quality of life for people. These include things like healthcare, being linked to jobs, improvements in productivity, basic uh, children well-being and education and protection for the aging population. Social protection floors are the basic minimum supports that government should provide and include access to essential health care, basic services for children, including nutrition, education and care, basic income security for people of an active age who are unable to uh, earn sufficient income and basic income security for older persons. Currently, according to the ILO, only 27% of the world's population has adequate social security coverage and half lack any coverage at all. Only 22% of unemployed people are covered by unemployment benefits. The fourth target is made up of three components. One is around access to basic services. The second is around tenure and legal rights over uh, property and natural resources, and the third is appropriate technology and financial services. This particular goal has very little data and is quite difficult to measure. The fifth target is focused on building resilience and limiting exposure and vulnerability to climate-related extreme events and other economic, social, and environmental shocks and disasters. This points to the sad fact that those who are poor are the most vulnerable to shocks in our system. 
The data here is a bit complex, but it generally shows that the poorest countries are disproportionately affected by disasters. The final targets within SDG 1 are means of implementation, the first one focusing on mobilization of resources and particularly development cooperation or aid, and the second looking at policy at the national, regional, and international levels that is pro-poor and gender sensitive. This is SDG 1. And that's it folks, that's all I have for you today. I know that was a ton of information, but it just goes to show how much is behind that little red box of no poverty and how many dimensions there really are to eliminating poverty in our world. I really hope you found it helpful. And as always, I have a blog post that provides information about my research as well as access to additional resources and a couple of organizations who work in a poverty alleviation that you may choose to follow or support if you are interested in this topic. I thank you so much for being here once again. If you like the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. It helps out the channel a ton and I really, really appreciate it. Thanks again for being here and I will see you in the next one. Until then, keep fighting the good fight and I'll see you soon. Bye!